So here's a beautiful theorem discovered by Kieran Kedlaya. When you take three positive integers x, y, and z and form this particular product, something remarkable happens. The entire product turns out to be a perfect square if and only if each individual factor is also a perfect square. It's one of those statements that feels almost too clean to be true. Now, whenever you see an if and only if statement like this, you need to prove it works both ways. Let's tackle the easier direction first, which will give us some intuition before we dive into the really interesting part. So let's assume each of these three factors is already a perfect square. We can write them as a squared, b squared, and c squared, where a, b, and c are just some positive integers. Well then, their product becomes a squared times b squared times c squared, which is just the square of a times b times c. Since a times b times c is definitely an integer, we've got ourselves a perfect square. And just like that, one direction is done. Now comes the really clever part. To prove the other direction, we're going to use one of my favorite proof techniques in all of mathematics, Forma's method of infinite descent. It's this beautiful idea where you show something can't exist by proving you could always find something smaller. Here's the setup. Let's suppose, just for the sake of argument, that there exists a minimal counterexample. That is, a triple of positive integers x, y, z with the smallest possible sum, where the product happens to be a perfect square, but at least one of the individual factors is not. Before we get to the main event, we need to establish something important. In any counterexample like this, the three numbers have to be different from each other. Let me show you why. Suppose two of our variables were the same. Let's say x equals y, just to see what happens. When we substitute y with x throughout our product, here's what we get. This simplifies beautifully to x squared plus 1 times the square of xz plus 1, all equaling some perfect square k squared. Now here's the key insight. For this entire product to be a perfect square, and since one of these terms is already a perfect square, the other term, x squared plus 1, must also be a perfect square. So let's say x squared plus 1 equals m squared for some integer m. Rearranging this gives us m squared minus x squared equals 1. And this factors as a difference of squares. m minus x times m plus x equals 1. Now, since x is a positive integer, it's at least 1. And since m squared is bigger than x squared, we know m is bigger than x. This means both m minus x and m plus x are positive integers. But here's the thing. The only way two positive integers can multiply to give you one is if both of them are exactly 1. So we need m minus x to equal 1 and m plus x to equal 1. But that would mean x equals 0 which contradicts our assumption that x is positive. We've reached a contradiction. The same argument works if we assume y equals z or z equals x. So in any counterexample, all three numbers must be different. Great, so we can arrange our minimal counterexample so that x is the biggest, y is in the middle, and z is the smallest. Now comes the really beautiful part. We're going to construct a smaller counterexample from our supposedly minimal one. The technique we'll use is called Vieta jumping, and it's one of those tools that feels almost like cheating once you see how it works. Here's the idea. We'll keep y and z fixed, but replace x with some variable t. We want to find integer values of t that make this whole expression a perfect square. When we expand out the terms involving t, something lovely happens. We get a quadratic expression. Now, the full details here get a bit intricate, but the key insight is that this creates a specific quadratic relationship. Through some careful algebra that I'll spare you the details of, it turns out that any integer solution, t, must satisfy a specific quadratic equation. The beautiful thing about quadratic equations is Vieta's formulas. Since we know x is one root of our quadratic, there must be another integer root, let's call it x prime. By Vieta's formulas, x plus x prime equals this specific expression involving x, y, and z. The exact formula for x prime gets a bit messy to derive, but here's what matters. 
we're guaranteed that x prime is an integer and the triple x prime y. Z gives us a new solution. Now, I need to show you three crucial facts about this x prime. First, that it's definitely an integer. Second, that it's positive. And third, that it's actually smaller than our original x. The first fact follows directly from how Vieta jumping works. The algebraic structure guarantees that if one root is an integer, so is the other. For the second fact, let's think about why x prime can't be negative. Since x prime yz forms a solution, their product must be a perfect square, which means it's definitely non-negative. So we need x prime times y plus 1 times y times z plus 1 times z times x prime plus 1 to be non-negative. Since y and z are positive, that middle factor is definitely positive, so we can focus on the other two. This leaves us with the condition that x prime y plus 1 times x prime z plus 1 must be non-negative. This is a quadratic in x prime that opens upward, and its roots are at negative 1 over y and negative 1 over z. For the parabola to be non-negative, x prime needs to be outside the interval between these roots. Since y is bigger than z, negative 1 over z is the larger of the two roots. Since z is at least 1, negative 1 over z is somewhere between negative 1 and 0. For x prime to be an integer greater than this, it must be at least 0. But wait, we also need to rule out x prime being exactly 0. Let's see what happens if we assume x prime is 0. If x prime is 0, then the first and third factors both become 1. So our product simplifies to just y times z plus 1. For this to be a perfect square, y times z plus 1 would have to be a perfect square. But here's the thing. There was nothing special about choosing x as our variable. We could just as well have done this whole construction with y or z. If we did the same construction with y and got y prime equals 0, that would force z times x plus 1 to be a square. Similarly for z, since we assumed we had a minimal counterexample, at least one of these constructions must give us 0. But that would mean all three factors are perfect squares from the start. But that contradicts our assumption that we had a counterexample in the first place, so x prime must be a positive integer. Now for the final and most important property, x prime is actually smaller than x. This is where the descent happens. From the Vieta relations, we get this expression for x times x prime. To show x prime is smaller than x, we need to show this product is less than x squared. After some algebra, we can bound x prime by 1 over x times this expression involving y over z plus z over y. Since we ordered our variables with x biggest and z smallest, we can get even better bounds on these terms. This gives us the bound that x prime is less than 1 over z plus 1. Since z is at least 1, x prime can be at most 2. This is the key insight. Whenever x is bigger than 2, we've constructed a smaller solution. The few remaining small cases can be checked directly, and none of them are actually counterexamples. And now we can deliver the final blow to our assumption. Remember, we started by assuming there was some minimal counterexample, a triple x, y, z with the smallest possible sum. But then we constructed another counterexample, x prime, y, z, where x prime is a positive integer that's strictly smaller than x. This new counterexample has a smaller sum than our supposedly minimal one. But that's impossible. We can't have something smaller than the smallest. We've reached a logical contradiction. The only way to resolve this paradox is to admit our initial assumption was wrong. There never was a counterexample to begin with, and that proves Kedlaya's theorem. Before we wrap up, I want to show you something really beautiful. There's this elegant family of solutions that emerges from a simple recurrence relation. This recurrence relation might look familiar if you know about Fibonacci numbers, but with a twist. When you take any three consecutive terms, something magical happens. They always satisfy Kedlaya's theorem. Let's verify this with the triple 1, 3, 8. 1 times 3 plus 1 gives us 4, which is 2 squared. 
3 times 8 plus 1 gives us 25, which is 5 squared. And 8 times 1 plus 1 gives us 9, which is 3 squared. Perfect squares across the board. And this isn't just a coincidence. This property holds for every single triple of consecutive terms in the sequence. You can prove this with mathematical induction, but even just seeing the pattern is pretty amazing. Now, if you want a taste of how modern mathematicians think about problems like this, there's a completely different perspective using something called elliptic curves. We start with the same setup. All three factors are perfect squares. These three equations carve out this intricate geometric surface in higher dimensional space. Finding our integer solutions is equivalent to finding special points called rational points on this geometric object. Through some deep algebraic geometry, it turns out this surface is intimately connected to something called an elliptic curve, which has this particular equation. What's incredible is that the rational points on an elliptic curve form what's called a group. They have this beautiful algebraic structure. By understanding this group, mathematicians can classify every possible solution to our original problem. It's a completely different approach that reveals the deep connections running throughout mathematics. And that's Kedlaya's beautiful theorem. If you enjoyed diving into this elegant piece of mathematics, please give this video a like and subscribe for more mathematical adventures. Until next time, keep exploring the incredible patterns that make mathematics so fascinating.